Awesome. Well, today what we're going to be looking at, our topic for today is the seven sacraments. So obviously you guys probably know what the sacraments are already, but we're going to kind of look into them maybe in a little bit different way than you've looked at them before and learn a little bit more about the sacraments and what role they have in our lives. Okay, hold on a second here. There we go. All right, you already did that. If you didn't, make sure you sign in. That way I know you're here. Um, let's see. So, yeah, we're going to learn about the power the sacraments have and the reason why Jesus gave us the sacraments. So, here's an illustration of some of the sacraments. There's one missing. Anyone figure out which one's missing? Which one? Confirmation? Uh, confirmation's right here. Anointing of the sick is missing. Yeah. Anointing of the sick is missing. I couldn't fit it all one slide. <laughs> but we have baptism, uh, holy orders, marriage, Eucharist, uh, reconciliation, confirmation, and anointing of the sick, the seven, seven sacraments. So we're going to kind of go through. Obviously, we can't say everything about all the sacraments today. We only have so much time. But um, So to kind of understand the sacraments, it's good to think about, well, they come from God. So if we first think about God, have you guys ever seen God? Like seen him actually face to face, right? Yeah, well, it even says in the Bible that no one has, right? He is a pure, infinite spirit, so we can't actually see God. God doesn't have a physical body by which to see him. But that's one of the normal ways in which we interact. We interact with people, right? We interact with each other because we're bodily. We can see one another, and we can hear their voice and everything. But what about God? How do we, how do we interact with him if we can't see him? Does it mean he's not here? Well, no, it doesn't. Uh, he is, in fact, very close to us at all times. But... But one of the ways we can think of is that, that because God is pure, infinite spirit, he's just too much for us to take in. It's kind of like if we were to try to stare at the sun. Um, the sun is there, right? But you can't really look straight at it. You can't see. And there's certain parts about the sun that we can't see because it's just so bright and our eyes just can't take it in. If you stare too long at it, that would be really bad. <laughs> you could go blind or seriously damage yourself, you know. We, we have to wait until moments like, I mean, a number of you got to see the uh, the, sol the solar eclipse that happened uh, last year. So uh, when you see the solar eclipse, it blots out the sun, so you can actually then see some of the details of the sun around the outside. So uh, this is a 360 video that I recorded while I was watching it. So it's kind of neat to see it go dark on the horizon and then... As it gets brighter again, it looks like a sunrise on the, all the way around the horizon. Pretty cool. So, but this is the same way. This is a great, good analogy for God is that there's He's just so much more than we can take in. So He somehow has to come up with a way in which to reveal Himself in a way that we can actually take in. You know, kind of like you know the sun getting blotted out by the eclipse. We can actually look at it at that point, right? You can even take off your solar glasses and actually look at the eclipse itself while it's darkened. So somehow God wants to make himself, which is kind of, he's invisible to us because he's just so much for us to take in. He wants to make that visible. So the sacraments are going to be all about the means that God's going to make visible the invisible. He's going to reveal himself through visible things. So, uh, this is the idea of sacraments or sacramentality that we see from the Bible is that God's invisible attributes, eternal power and divinity, have been able to be understood and perceived in what he has made. So first, God makes any every visible thing he makes is supposed to kind of show forth his power and his glory, that whatever we look at should point us to him. So, so anything can point us to God. Whether it's something as small as ants, I don't know, that's something that I always found fascinating when I was growing up, was watching the ants and, you know, building the, the different things. I was like, wow, those are just amazing little creatures. So, I don't know, maybe you didn't have the same experience. <laughs> but Or things as glorious as, like, a mountain. Um, that photo was taken back when I was in college, and uh, 
I was studying astronomy at that time, and uh, after a night of not having very good weather for observing the stars, we kind of quit early, and we decided we were going to go climb uh, Medicine Bow Peak. This was in uh, Wyoming. We are going to go cl climb this, uh, what was it, 13,000-foot mountain um, at 4 in the morning. Fortunately, it was a, it was a, uh, a full moon, so we could actually see because we, none of us had flashlights. <laughs> you know, we're college kids. We think this is a great idea. <laughs> so we climb it at 4 in the morning, and we're at, we get to watch the sunrise from the top of the mountain. And it was just this amazing experience and like, wow, you know, in order, this is such beauty, beauty of God's creation. It kind of points you towards him. So we can see God and, and, and kind of experience him through the things that he's made. Of course, the greatest way that he's made himself visible is through Jesus. So Jesus, we could call him the sacrament. He's the way in which God makes his invisible power visible to us. So that's actually the uh, the end of John's line there when he says, nobody has seen God. It continues, the only son, God, who is at the Father's side, has revealed him. So we haven't, no one saw God until Jesus revealed him. And of course, now that, uh, you know, Jesus came and revealed himself, um, he's kind of limited in the way that he can move around on the earth. So He's going to ha he wants to create a way in which he can continue to, we can continue to visibly see God's power even if he can't he is invisibly in his bodily form with us at every moment. All right, so that brings us to the sacraments. Jesus wants to give us the sacraments to be these visible signs to show forth God's presence and His power in our lives. So when we learn about the sacraments, there's four big characteristics of the seven sacraments. The first characteristic is uh, that it's a efficacious sign of grace. So we'll talk about what that means. You may have heard this before in studying the sacraments. Some of you remember this. So that's my picture of a sign of grace. It's a sign with the little lines that mean like they're shining with God's grace. Right? So it's a sign of grace. Yeah, I know. It's great. <laughs> then it's uh, instituted by Christ. So that's Jesus there. It's better than a stick person. <laughs> that's Jesus, instituted by Christ. So he's the one who gave it. So we can look in the Bible. We can see the beginnings of all seven sacraments. Then it's also entrusted to the church. Uh, so it's not quite as fancy as ours. But, you know, entrusted to. So we're the ones who kind of care for the sacraments. And then finally, it's by which the divine life is given. So not only does it point us, it's a sign of the grace of his life. He gives it to us. So we're filled with his divine life. So talk about that just a little bit more. So for the seven sacraments, the first is that it's an efficacious sign of grace. So we'll break that apart a little bit. First is grace. So grace is the word that we, we you probably hear, hear that all the time, right? We talk about grace as part of our faith. It's God's life. His divine life of love that he wants to share with us. This we Last time when we looked at the whole history of, or not last time, two times ago when we looked at the history of salvation, we learned that this is really the purpose of, of God wanting to make us. He wants to share his life with us. So this is what we call grace. And then second is a sign. So a sign is something that is a visible thing that points us out something. Like, for example, a stop sign, right? is a visible symbol to point out the fact that you should slow down and come to a complete stop, as we always do at stop signs, right? Hopefully. <laughs> and efficacious. Efficacious is a fancy word that means that it, it brings about what it points to. So it has a certain power to it. Um, so if we think about uh, efficacious, um, so it brings about what it points to. It makes happen the grace that it's pointing out. Um, so, for example, like we could think of different kind of normal signs. Um, like, for example, a sign that you might have is your driver's license, right? It's a sign that points out to somebody that you have the you have the legal ability to drive your vehicle, right? And in a sense, it's efficacious. It gives you that power because without it, you're not you can't drive with. It if you don't have a license, right? Um, 
But even more so, things it, the sacraments have this kind of power. So we'll look at each of we'll look at each of the sacraments. But if we think about the first one, baptism, um, baptism has a a sign. So what do you think is the visible part of baptism? What do we see when you see a baptism happen? There's water, and then there's also the words that we say in the name of the Father, and I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's the visible sign that we see, and and it's a sign that kind of, you know, pouring of water should make us think of like cleaning, right? Like if you wash your hands, you're being cleansed with water. Well, it's a visible sign of God's grace. So it's a sign of God cleaning us of sin. But it's also efficacious, meaning that it actually makes it happen. So not only does it remind us of God's grace that can remove sin when the baby's baptized, it actually does remove the sin and give him grace. So all the seven sacraments have this characteristic, that they're visible signs that we can see. They are meant to be signs of some, some aspect of God's grace, his life, and it has the power to actually give us that grace. So it's pretty awesome. Uh, so then they're instituted by Christ. We can go back to the Bible and we can see how Jesus gave all seven of these to us. Now, some of them are much clearer than others. Some of them we see, we, they, the way that we celebrate them today might look a little bit different from the way that he actually instituted them. But the origins of all of them we can find in Jesus himself. Um, and then they're given to the church, entrusted to the church. So the church is the, we, last time we talked a lot about the Catholic Church. And I mentioned last time about, you know, the sacraments are one of the important things that, one of the important reasons why God gives us a community with a leadership so that he can make sure that the sacraments are handed down faithfully. So if we didn't have a church, we wouldn't have any sacraments. And really the sacraments help make what the church is. The two are intimately linked together. Um, so if somebody says, well, I just want to follow Jesus but not have the church, well, then that means they're not going to be able to have the sacraments. But the sacraments are the visible way in which Jesus wants to show his divine life, and not just show it, but actually give it to us. So that's why the church with her sacraments are, are so important. So the neat thing about the sacraments is that, like, like, as a priest, I do a lot of the sacraments as one of the leaders in the church. But I don't make up how to do it. <laughs> like, I can't get up at Mass and just start using my own words. There are specific words that I have to use. So the sacraments are something given to us. We don't get to make or change them. So, And finally, divine life is given to us through the sacraments. So um, there's, we can talk about God coming to dwell in us. So he comes and lives in us. Not only does he give us his life, but he begins to live within us. Uh, it helps us to live with the different virtues instead of the, the bad vices we have you know, grow in virtue throughout our life. Uh, he fills us with faith, hope, and, and love. Those are the, the theological virtues, the highest virtues. Uh, we receive the gifts and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about those a lot more when we talk about confirmation. So we're going to kind of skip over confirmation today and because next time we will cover confirmation and only confirmation. <laughs> um, so and uh, helps us also to live out the beatitudes, you know, to be poor in spirit, to be to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Um, so helps us to become a saint. Uh, in other words, so the sacraments are this very important uh, place where we receive God's grace. Now it's not the only way in which we can receive God's grace. The two main ways in which we receive God's grace is prayer and sacraments. So by making sure we, you know, mass. Confession, you know, we'll talk about how where the place of the other sacraments are in our lives, uh, but also prayer, spending time in personal prayer. Because if God wants to share His life with us, I mean, this is a very personal thing. You know, He wants to. I mean, it's a, a friendship with Him. So if you have a friend with somebody, you want, you spend time with them, and so prayer is going to be very important too. But the difference between them is kind of like the order of of of, uh, of intensity in a sense. So uh, an analogy you could use is say uh, our prayer is kind of like flashlight. This is a very weak one because the batteries are almost dead, but this one has this one's a little bit better. So, so 
I can shine it towards you guys because I won't blind you with it probably. But that's kind of like prayer, is like a flashlight. But sacraments are like the laser. So the difference scientifically between them is that in a flashlight, it has, gives different wavelengths and they're all out of sync. But in a laser, the reason why it has so intense, so that's pretty bright if you stare at it too much, um, they're, all the wavelengths are lined up in exactly the same way. And so you have a very concentrated and very intense beam of light. In fact, if you have powerful enough lasers, you can they're pretty dangerous. And, and this is, obviously, you'd never look at, into this. So I'm not shining it toward you guys. So, um, so prayer is like the flashlight. We receive God's grace. But then the sacraments are these moments of intense encounters with God where he can fill us even in a greater way with, with his sacraments. So uh, we could say that uh, sacraments are grace lasers. So you're welcome to use that if you'd like. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about seven sacraments. And we're going to kind of... Um, we can split them up into like like uh, three main categories. So the first three sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist, uh, we call the sacraments of initiation. When we receive all three of them, we're completely initiated into the life of, of God. Um, so you still have one to receive of those sacraments of initiation. That's what we're preparing for now. So we'll learn we'll learn about that. Then we have the sacraments of healing. So healing both of body and soul. So we have uh, reconciliation to heal our soul, and we have uh, anointing of the sick to heal our body. Though we'll find that actually both of them have a connection to each other and a relationship to both the body and the soul in it when it comes to healing. And then finally, there are two sacraments for very specific vocations to service within the church. Obviously, those are not the only way in which we can serve God, marriage or holy orders. But these are two that are in particular need of specific kinds of grace that God gives through those two sacraments. So we'll start looking at um, these seven sacraments and the, the, what it gives to us. Why, why Jesus, how Jesus, why he gives it to us, um, what it does for the person who receives them. So baptism um, should have all be baptized because... You can't get confirmed unless you're baptized first. So <laughs> if you're not baptized, let me know right away. <laughs> um, you don't have to say it out loud here. But no, I think you're pretty much baptized. That's why we need a baptismal certificate from you guys if we don't. If you weren't baptized here, you need it sent to us. So baptism goes back to um, Jesus. He instituted it, just like we mentioned. The institution of baptism comes from when Jesus himself was baptized. Now this was a little bit the Jewish people had a kind of baptism. John the Baptist did baptisms for the forgiveness of sin. So it was a sign of repentance, but it didn't actually yet have power to get rid of sins. It wasn't efficacious yet. And so when Jesus was baptized, was Jesus baptized because he needed to get rid of sins? No, he didn't have sin, right? <laughs> what he did was he actually enabled the, enabled the sacrament to be efficacious to actually fill the sacrament with his life. And so when we're baptized, then we receive God's life. Sins are forgiven. So that's why Jesus is baptized. Not because he needed it, but because he changed it into what we need. Um, so it's the first sacrament we receive. It introduces us to God's life. Um, so the sign, um, as we mentioned before, the outward sign is, is the water being poured as well, or you can also uh, submerge. <laughs> That's possible as well to do that. Uh, and also using the words, name of the person, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So that is the visible sign, both a, a something we can see and also something we can hear put together. And we'll see that Pretty much all the sacraments work that way. There is a phys visible physical sign as well as words that go with it as well um, as part of the sacrament. So um, what's the divine life? Well, original sin is taken away. Um, God is able to bring us, we're able to be brought back into friendship uh, with him. Original sin is taken away. We're, we're, we're incorporated. That means we're made part of the body of Jesus. 
So uh, we're brought into his body, the church, so we become members of his church, and uh, we become born into the life of the Holy Spirit. So now the Holy Spirit can begin to work in us. And uh, so there's a connection between us receiving the Holy Spirit in baptism and when we receive it in confirmation. Um, so when we talk about confirmation, they're kind of connected to one another. And in fact, um, depending upon certain in certain areas of Christianity, they actually confirm at the same time that they baptize. So they would have been confirmed when, as babies rather than rather than later. There's different reasons why we wait until now, um, though. It would be good if we did a little bit earlier, maybe give you guys the extra graces of the Holy Spirit even sooner. <laughs> um, so, um, how is it given to the church? Well, it's given uh, through the pouring of water or submersion at some points. Uh, we could ask, who is the one who baptizes? So, who get, who baptizes in the church, do you think? If you've been to a baptism, who's, who's done the baptizing? The priest will? Anybody else who can baptize? Bishops could obviously can baptize, yeah. So, yes, deacon, deacons and then actually anyone. Did you know you can baptize someone? Even, but only in emergency cases. You wouldn't just go around baptizing people. <laughs> but in an emergency case where somebody wants to be baptized and there's no, no priest or deacon around, then anybody can baptize. So let's say, you know, you're in a hospital and the baby is, and you know, you're a nurse or something. The baby's in danger of death and you can't get a hold of a priest to get there right away. And so, and the parents want them to be baptized. And so, I mean, you could baptize them there. And then, uh, uh, then they'd, be they'd be recorded and, and, and uh, you could go through the rest of the baptismal rite. If the child lives, they could go through the rest of the rite later. So, um, as a priest, I actually have baptized babies that have been in danger of death in hospital situations like that. So. They're so tiny. Uh, who can be baptized? Anybody who's not baptized. Anybody who's not been baptized. If you're already baptized, you can't get baptized again. Because it's efficacious. It works. As soon as you're baptized, you receive God's grace. You can't get it again. Uh, and then, uh, when are you baptized? As soon as possible. <laughs> because if you're taking away original sin, I mean, you want that to happen, and you're being filled with God's life, you want that to happen as soon as you can. You know, so that's why parents, you know, after they have a child, to get baptize their child as soon as possible. How many of you know your date of your baptism? Uh, see, this is a great thing. See, we celebrate our birthdays, but you could also you could have a second one, right? Celebrate your baptism as well. Yeah. It's a great opportunity. I, was, I didn't don't worry, I didn't I didn't know what my baptism date was until I was in the seminary. We had a, a priest who would send us cards on our baptism day rather than on our birthday. So I was baptized eight days after I was born. So, All right. So uh, why would we baptize babies? Well, I just kind of gave you the answer. Why would you wait, right? But some there's some ideas today where there's some Christians who won't baptize babies or children. And their thought is, is that, well, we're going to wait until they get older, and then they can choose whether or not they want to follow Jesus. And so, because it's like you have to, you have to make the decision to choose to choose to follow God. You know, whereas, I mean, assuming you guys were born, you were baptized soon after you were born, you didn't have much of a choice, right? But if you think about it, when you're a baby, I mean, you don't really have the ability to choose the things that are good for you, right? I mean, you're just like sitting there and you're crying, like, I'm hungry, I would like food. But I really, you don't have the ability to choose what food you want. Your parents give you what's good for you. And, or, or like, even, I mean, as little kids get older, it might be like, you know, I want to wear these clothes. But you know it's like snowing in like 20 degrees below zero. You want to wear shorts and a t-shirt. Sorry, you're not going to. <laughs> so sometimes parents will make choices for us, right? If we can't, if we're not able to make the right choice for ourselves, especially when we're young, and so that's really the, one of the reasons why, if if parents have the ability to choose what is good for us before we have the ability to choose it, so just as we wouldn't wait around and, be, and wait around and think like, well, little Johnny, would you like to eat, you know, a hamburger or would you like to eat candy? 
for lunch? You know, it's like, well, no, you're going to eat good food. You know, do you want to eat your vegetables or no? <laughs> so we make decisions for the ba for babies. I mean, to be filled with God's life or not to be filled with God's life. If they knew really, if, they, if a child understood what it's all about, they would choose it. And so parents choose it for them. So we'll look just very briefly at what the rite of baptism looks like. That is my baptism there. So proves that I was baptized. That's me and my dad and my grandpa and my great-grandfather. So if we look very close, very briefly at the rite of baptism, uh, there's a role for parents and godparents. So the godparents, their role is to help the parents in raising the child. So there's a great responsibility that parents make. Obviously, if the child, I mean, they're making a decision for the child, and they have to promise to help raise the child in the faith. In the faith. There's a responsibility as part of that. Uh, there's an exorcism and anointing. So an exorcism is a prayer of help asking for the child to be protected from evil. And an anointing, the uh, anointing is a sign of strengthening. We'll talk about anointing more when we talk about confirmation. That's a slightly different anointing. Um, so there's also the blessing of the water. So we bless the water, asking it to be given the power of Jesus when he was baptized so that the water can make the child holy. Um, so let's see. There's images from water from the Old Testament when we when we bless it. Um, reminds us of God breathing across the waters when he made creation, about the, the, the waters of the flood that helped cleanse the earth of evil at that time, the waters of the Red Sea that the Israelites went through from slavery into freedom. And all those are <coughs> symbols and signs of, of the baptism that we would be able to receive later blood and water. The water that came forth from Jesus' side, blood and water, the water represents baptism, and the blood, which sacrament do you think? Eucharist. Yep. So, and uh, we do it in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because that's what Jesus said. He said to baptize that way. <laughs> so that's the way we do it. Um, so we also ask a renewal of baptismal promises. So these are promises your parents made for you at your baptism, but we at different points throughout the, at, during the year, we also make these these same promises. We reject Satan, and we say that we do believe in uh, in in God. Uh, so let's see, what's the sign of grace? We already looked. So then the, that then the sign of grace happens, where we actually baptize the child, as we already saw. And then uh, there's some other symbols that these aren't in themselves sacraments, but they're more like sacramentals. So there's the sign of the white garment represents us becoming clean. There's the symbol of the candle that's lit, which represents that now we're filled with God's light. You know, very intense light, right? No. We don't hand out lasers, but... <laughs> um, and then the ephephtha is at the end, uh, is near the end of the, the rite where uh, we touch the, the mouth and the ears of the child uh, so that the child may grow to be able to to uh, share God, both hear God's word and be able to share it um, as they, they get older. So then there's a final blessing. We have a blessing specifically for the mother and then for the father and then for everybody. And it's neat with the, the, uh, the uh, for the mother, it's especially giving thanks for her motherhood. And for the father, it's a blessing to help be a very important teacher uh, of, of the child uh, because it's both the, the Husband and wife are going to be the t first teachers of, of the children. So confirmation, we're going to kind of kind of skip over. It's part of the three sacraments of initiation, but we'll we'll cut, return to it um, next time we meet. So we'll go ahead then to the Eucharist. So any questions on baptism? We go to the Eucharist. No, pretty familiar with baptism. All right, Eucharist. So we can look back to how did Jesus give us the Eucharist? And uh, this, this picture that I'm showing you here is actually a uh, photo that I took when I was in Capernaum. And it's an image of, the, uh, of a very early uh, synagogue in Capernaum. Um, and it was in the synagogue in Capernaum that Jesus gave one of his teachings about the Eucharist. It's called the Bread of Life Discourse. 
this isn't the exact uh, synagogue. Um, the synagogue Jesus would have preached in would have been built just prior to this one, and then this one would have replaced that one. So, but it's like it, it, they it's likely that it was in the same spot uh, in that uh, in that town in, in Capernaum. So, in the Bread of Life discourse is one of the most beautiful passages describing um, the Eucharist, and uh, and in it it makes so clear what the Eucharist is. So I'll kind of, it's rather lengthy, so I'll skip some of the first parts of it. <laughs> so in there, um, Jesus has said, you know, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. So Jesus is wanting to give a special kind of bread that's going to give life. He put it in the, con he a little bit before that he talks about how God gave them manna in the desert to sustain them, this kind of bread from heaven. But he's saying that, you know, the bread from heaven that he's going to give them is going to be a bread that can help them live forever. Because even though they ate the manna in the desert, they still eventually died. But the bread that he's going to give is going to help them live forever. And then he explains what the bread is. He says, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. So he's going to give his flesh to eat. And that's precisely the way the, Jew, the Jews understood it. It says that the Jews quarreled among themselves and saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So they're thinking that that's what Jesus means, that he's going to give flesh to eat. But for Jewish people, that was absolutely, I mean, you weren't even allowed to drink, or you weren't even allowed to eat um, meat of certain kinds of creatures, like you couldn't eat pork. <laughs> you weren't allowed to, um, eat meat that still had blood in it. Um, it there it had sense that blood had to be drained from the animal prior to being able to eat that meat. And also, definitely not human beings. I mean, that would have been absolutely atrocious to do that uh, for Jewish people. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you my flesh to eat. And they're like, wait a second here. What's going on? And so then Jesus, so if Jesus doesn't mean them to think that way, he's going to have to, you know, correct them. But we see he doesn't. He says to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have life within you. So not only does he say, you got to eat my flesh, he's also, you have to drink my blood. Instead, he bumps it up a level. You have to do more. But he's not done. He continues. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood is the life, eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. So that's the second time. And then he goes a third time. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Then a fourth time, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. And a fifth time, just as the living Father sent me and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. And, and, and a sixth time, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. So six more times compared with the very first time that he did it, that's seven times that he tells us that we have to eat his body and drink his blood. And so that's the number of perfection for Jewish people. Um, so Jesus is very serious in this passage um, that what goes on in the sacrament of the Eucharist is the giving of his very flesh and blood. And so he teaches about it here when he's here at this synagogue, but then he actually gives it to us when he's there at the Last Supper. So the Last Supper becomes the first Mass in which Jesus gives us his body and blood. And he literally says that as part of the Last Supper, right? This is my body given up for you. This is the blood of the new covenant. Um, so Jesus, and then he offers his body then on the cross. Those two are connected to one another. The, cross, the Last Supper, the cross, as well as his resurrection. So the sign of grace that we have at Mass is precisely this sign that Jesus gives us, both when he's giving the Bread of Life discourse and when he's at the Last Supper, that he's going to use bread and wine, and the wine has a little bit of water that's poured into it, and he's going to use the words, this is my body and this is my blood. So I thought I'd use some of my, I made some video clips of, of uh, celebrating the Mass, so you can kind of see up close what it looks like when it's going on. So. Those are the moments in 
the moments at Mass when the priest prays over the bread and wine, saying the words of Jesus himself, um, offering his body and blood uh, for us. It's the most, it's the high point of the Mass when that is going on. So this is just some clips of a, uh, I did a video series that I made on the Mass, and so that's where that comes from. <laughs> I want to show you the whole video series. Um, let's see. So if we go to the next one. So how is it given to the church? How do we receive it? Well, we receive it through bishops and priests. We'll talk about bishops and priests later when we talk about holy orders. But it's through bishops and priests that are given the ability to say the words of Jesus and actually make the exact same thing that Jesus did at the Last Supper also happen whenever we're at Mass. Um, it's pretty uh, amazing, amazing thing. And one of the things that um, I like to point out to people is to try to help them understand like what goes on at certain points during the Mass and like what we're supposed to do. Um, so I won't go through everything at Mass, but we'll, we'll hit some high points here. So have you guys ever been bored at Mass? You don't have to lie. No, <laughs> you can tell the truth. Never at yours, Father Vogel. We're never bored at your mass. Yes, we can be bored at mass sometimes. I've been bored at mass sometimes. <laughs> Not when I'm sick, no. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes it will. And you know, sometimes we, some masses, it might feel like I'm not getting much out of this. Like, well, maybe like, well, the music today isn't all that great. Or, or the, uh, you know, Father didn't do the greatest in his homily. I don't know what it was about. It really didn't mean anything to me. Uh, but all those, even though all the, all the different aspects of Mass are supposed to help us to be able to see God, even if, like, the music isn't the best that day or the, uh, because there are some times where it's like, you know, I don't, like, always like all every piece of music that we use at Mass. <laughs> but... Or, or like the homily is not that great from the priest that day, uh, or you didn't get anything out of the readings. What always happens is Jesus comes to us in the Eucharist, that he gives us his body and his blood. God himself is there giving himself for our food. And so even if it might feel boring, can it really be boring if God himself is here giving himself to us as his food? If we really could see that, if we really, you know, thought about that every mass how could we how could we allow mass to be to to be boring but it might be that part of the reason why it can be boring is we're not really sure what we're supposed to do at certain points during mass you know like so from the very beginning of mass we're we're entering heaven in a sense we're coming into heaven there's there's really three things happening at mass all at the same time there is the future of heaven that kind of comes down to us there's also the past of Jesus' is offering himself on the cross. And then there's the present of us being there. And so that's what Jesus really wants to happen at Mass, is that we come connected with both the sacrifice that he made for us on Calvary. So we're like literally there on Calvary at the foot of his cross when we're at Mass. We're literally there. And we're also literally in heaven, too, at the same time. And, of course, this is possible for God, right? Because... For God, he can be everywhere at once and every time at once. <laughs> and so this, this, that's really kind of the miraculous event that happens in heaven. So the moment we enter Mass, the moment it starts, that's where we're at. You know, that's why we have churches, you know, church, churches designed with stained glass windows and pictures of saints and all these images to try to remind us that we're not in the normal place. It's also why we use different kinds of language. Like at the beginning of Mass, when I greet you, I don't say, hey, how's it going? What's up today? <laughs> say things like the Lord be with you and with your spirit you know it's a different language you wouldn't go around using right or or the singing of it right we don't really go around singing our greetings to one another you might be like that's be weird <laughs> but the singing at mass that we do the singing of the greetings and, and different parts of mass is supposed to lift us up in into heaven so then the first part of the mass well one of the first things that we do as part of the Mass is we're supposed to uh, call to mind our sins. 
So it's the penitential rite before we do the Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, or we do the the uh, the uh, confidior, I confess to Almighty God. Um, so during that point, when when uh, the priest says, "Let us call to mind our sins," we're actually supposed to do that. Like think back and think of well, what are what kinds of sins do I need forgiving forgive to be forgiven from God? To think of those things and then to ask God for forgiveness. So that's kind of specifically what we're trying to do at that point. Because I would guess that there's probably some times when we say that and you're just kind of like, nothing comes. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to do, is to think back, what are the things I need to ask God for forgiveness for? You know, some of the things that might have happened in the last week. Then, after our sins are forgiven, we give glory to God by singing the, the song of the angels that they sang at Jesus' birth. So that's where that... Um, that uh, phrase comes from, the glory to God in the highest. Um, skip over a few parts here, but the, uh, the liturgy of the word is kind of the first half of the Mass in which we listen to the readings, right? From the Old Testament, from, from the New Testament, there's a psalm, there's the gospel. And so really what's going on is, is uh, the scriptures is the way in which God wants to speak to us. Um, that we can actually hear his words, because as we talked before, you know, God's invisible. We don't always see him. We can't. We don't always get a voice from the clouds or from the burning bush telling us that you know what we're supposed to do. But one of the major ways in which Jesus does speak to us is through his scriptures. And so when we hear the readings, that's precisely what God is trying to do. He's trying to to speak to us. So if you're listening to the readings and um, Oftentimes it might be in the case of like you just hear like a line or a phrase that maybe it's like, hmm, I never really heard that before. And maybe it has a certain meaning to you at that point. You know, God's probably trying to talk to you, to tell you something through those through that part of the reading. Or it might be during the homily where, you know, the, our job as the priest is that we're supposed to take the readings that are sometimes difficult to understand and help you understand it. Um, so that's part of the part of the reason why we have a homily. Um, so that so the first part is that we're listening to God, and He's trying to speak something to us, right? So He's speaking to us regardless whether we hear it or not. He's always saying something to us, because I would guess that there are times in which the readings are being read, and you get to the end of the reading, and you're like, I have no idea what they just said. <laughs> that even happens to me, but that's okay because. At, at times, we want to try our best to have, pay attention, but God knows that we can be weak, and we may not always have the ability to pay perfect attention at every moment through the entire Mass. The great thing is, is that even if we drift away at some points and start thinking about other things, he's still going to give us his body and blood. It's not going to stop him from coming, even if we weren't paying attention the, as perfectly the whole time. He's still going to make that happen. Of course, there's things we can do to kind of get back on track. If you read the readings ahead of time, that can help you stay focused in the readings a lot more. Or sometimes if you get distracted by things, sometimes that might be the things God wants you to tell him about. So let's say you're at Mass and, you know, you had a bunch of stuff going on this week and, like, there's some difficult stuff at school that you have, you're dealing with. And so as you're there at Mass, you, you, your mind starts wandering to those things that are going on and you're not really paying attention to what's going on at Mass. Well, those are things that are part of your life that God probably, I mean, that you can tell him about. You know, that's a wonderful way to pray at Mass is to, you know, the things that are going on in your life to talk to him about. You know, ask for his help uh, with those things. It's a great way to pray uh, during the Mass. So as the Mass continues, the second half of the Mass is the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And as you go from the Liturgy of the Word to the Liturgy of the Eucharist, there's the point, you know, where... Uh, the kids bring up the the money, right? <laughs> and so, and and so, what you're supposed to do at that point is watch the kids, right? That's the important. No. <laughs> um, well, that's okay if you do. <laughs> um, what that represents is that we're trying to offer ourselves to God. So when the gifts are brought forward, the money that each the offering that people will give, as well as the bread and the wine, represents. Us wanting to give ourselves to God. And so at Mass, this is the way that we can pray at that point, is that you pray and you can imagine putting yourself on the altar. 
like all the stuff that went on this past week. You know, there's some really great stuff. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to give that to you. Or there was some really junky stuff. You know, I need your help more with that this coming week, Lord. I'm going to give that to you. And imagine putting it there with the gifts on the altar. Because that's literally what is going on, is that at Mass, as I'm praying behind the altar, um, and you're kneeling there, and you might be like, man, this is really long prayer, and my Father's just, I mean, I'm not doing anything. Well, what's going on is I'm not only praying over the bread and the wine, I'm praying over each one of you guys while you're there at Mass. And I'm taking all of your life, whatever it is, that you bring to Jesus, that Mass, and I'm offering it to God. And he's going to transform it, just like he does to the bread and wine at Mass. So at Mass, when we're there, he, he transforms it use the, using the words of Jesus into his body and blood. Well, he does the same kind of thing with you guys, is that he wants to transform our lives. It's not so that you become Jesus' body and blood, but so that you become more like Jesus. So you give him yourself. God takes you with Jesus, and then he gives you back himself in Holy Communion. So you receive Jesus himself in the Eucharist. So all the stuff that went on that week, you give it to him. He gives you his life to give you the energy to go back out to do the next week of whatever stuff you have to do. And then by the time that week ends, I mean, you've got all this new stuff that might have happened that you want to bring to God. You give it to him. He takes it. And he gives you back himself in the Eucharist again. And every week, that's what goes on. You bring, We bring ourselves, it's united with Jesus, and then he gives us himself back as our food to help us in the next week to come. So this is really the amazing thing about the Mass and why it's one of, as a priest, it's one of my, I love saying the Mass because I get to connect you guys to Jesus and then... Through me, he's able to feed you with his life so that you can do everything that we, you can, you can follow him this the coming week. Um, so like, as a priest, you know, well, you, as I'm sure you're aware, I mean, one of the, one of the teachings of the church or one of its rules is that you should go to mass every Sunday, right? And that it's, I mean, it's a mortal sin to miss mass. And the reason why it's such a big deal is because that's the place where, you know, Jesus can intensely fill us with his grace. <laughs> you know. And when we don't go, it's basically say, like, don't bother God. I got this on my own. I don't really need you. But so but when I see like if somebody chooses not to go to Mass, like I don't get it's not so much about whether well, breaking rules as to I can't live without Jesus in the Eucharist. And I don't know how they can, but God wants to fill them with so much life. And they don't know what life they're missing. They're missing so much that God wants to give them this week, but when they choose not to go to Mass, then he can't give it to them in the same way that he wants to. And so when you do come to Mass, then he can have that ability to fill you even greater with his life so that, I mean, the following week is going to be so much better than if we try to do it without him. So that's kind of the biggest thing when it comes to, to Mass. Is, as a priest, it's not so much my concern that, you know, when somebody misses that they're breaking the rules, but it's that they just don't have the life from God that they need for that coming week. So um, that's a very brief thing about the mass. We could go into a lot more details. We could give, we could do a whole, a whole one of these just on the mass. There's so much to, so much to talk about. Um, we should finish with the end of mass. The end of mass it says, "Go forth." The mass is ended. Well, that's where the name Mass comes from. Mass means, uh, are the Latin words at the end of Mass is, is ite misa est. Misa is where Mass comes from, and it means mission. You guys have a mission to go and be Christ out in the world, wherever you are. So he fills you with his life, and then he sends you on the mission. Well, we'll spend another time, another one of these sessions, we'll be talk more specifically about mission and what, what mission God sends us on. So uh, let's take a short little break. So, we're going to look at reconciliation. Very important. We've moved now from the, uh, the sacraments of initiation to the sacraments of healing. So sacrament of reconciliation. Um, the reason why we need it is because of sin. 
um, as why we need all the sacraments, really, to get rid of sin and be filled with his grace. So sin is something we choose to do that offends God, and it's, it's really against reason. Whenever we sin, we're basically acting insane, in a sense, uh, because it doesn't really make sense to do something that's against the very life that we depend upon. Um, it stops us from being happy, ultimately, and there's sin that can be both sin that's you know maybe primarily about ourselves, but all sin also has an effect on others. So, I mean, from the very beginning when we had Adam and Eve, there was an effect upon each other that it kind of broke their relationship apart when they sinned against God. And so it's the same way sin also harms other people. So you might, you know, that might come to mind in ways in which you might have done something and then you see how it harms a relationship with somebody else, a friend or a family member. Um, so sin continued to grow worse and worse and worse uh, through the course of time. Um, right, right from the very beginning, so we get uh, uh, Cain, and Cain killing his brother Abel. Um, it got to the point in which, I mean, it was so bad that God even expresses regret for making humankind. Not that he didn't no longer loved us, but that it saddened him so to see us, you know, so far from the way he, <clears throat> so far from receiving the life that he wanted to give. And so that leads to Noah and the ark leads to the cleansing of the world which uh, through the flood, which, as we saw already, kind of is a symbol of baptism. Um, and this, it wasn't so much that God wanted to kill people as to try to save their spiritual souls, ended their physical life to save their spiritual souls. So we kind of talked a little bit more about Noah um, when we were looking at the whole salvation history, um, that really this is a way to help them repent. Uh, because ultimately he wanted to renew his covenant with Noah after the flood. But now, built in, now, you know, the rainbow was a sign that that would never happen again. That he would never use that means to ask us to repent. Now there's two main reason, ways in which we can, which sin can be, which we can repent and sin can be removed. The first is baptism. As we already saw, through baptism, this helps us, cleanse us, it removes sin from us. But, even after baptism, we still can choose to do something that's against God. So we need another sacrament to help us to remove that sin even after we're baptized. Um, and so we see that in the scriptures that Jesus will do that. He forgives sins often whenever he's healing someone physically. Um, he will also forgive sins. So this is the example of the, uh, the woman caught in adultery. He tells her, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. But even the case of like the healing of the man who is a paralytic. And remember the story, he gets lowered down by his friends into the house because this, the crowds are too big. Uh, the first thing that Jesus says to that man, even before he heals him physically, is your sins are forgiven. Which was a sign that he was God, that he would forgive uh, sins. So um, he also preached very often about wanting to forgive our sins. All of the rites in the Old Testament, like the Passover ritual where they sacrificed lambs and, and they those were all for trying to forgive people's sins. But in the Old Testament, they didn't have the power of Jesus yet. And so then in the New Testament, Jesus is going to pass this on to his church, first to the apostles and then to the rest of his church, this ability to forgive sins. And it's often represented by the giving of the keys to Peter. Where Jesus in that passage in the Bible says specifically to Peter, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, whose sins you retain are retained. So in other words, if you forgive sins using because you have my power of the keys, then they are going to be forgiven. Because you're using my power to do it. And so we see that this is where the ability of this sacrament given to the priest to be able to, when you come and confess your sins, the priest has the ability to then forgive you. <coughs> So there's th four main parts to, to when we go to confession, um, when we use the sacrament of reconciliation, we first have to have contrition, meaning we have to be sorry for what we're do we've done. If you're not sorry for what you've done, I mean, you're not really asking for forgiveness. If you're just like, well, I really don't care what I did, I'm going to do it anyway. Well, I mean, you're, we're not really asking God to forgive us. So we have to be, we have to have sorrow for our sins. We have to have contrition. Then we have to do confession. We have to say our sins aloud. We also see this in, in one of the letters to James where he says to confess our sins aloud. Um, because obviously the minister who's acting in Jesus' person has to know what he's forgiving. right? So you, that's why you have to say it verbally to us. Then there's going to be an act of penance that's given. 
Um, the act of penance is a, a good act, whether of prayer or some kind of good deed that the priest will give you to do that kind of helps undo the bad that the sin does to us. Because even though we're forgiven, there's still this kind of residue um, within us of the sin that can lead us to sin again. Um, because we can get into the habits of sin, right? Sometimes that may be the case where we where we might go to confession and we find that every time we go to confession, often we're saying the same thing because we get into that habit. So the penances help us to break that kind of habit, um, to kind of counter counter the uh, the uh, the bad. It's the beginning of not sinning anymore, as Jesus told the woman. And then there's the absolution, and the absolution is the prayer that the priest prays that actually then use it. He becomes the voice of Jesus, forgiving your sins. So. And it's such a wonderful gift of the sacrament of reconciliation because through it you actually get to hear from you get to hear God's voice in a sense telling you you're forgiven. You know, because sometimes we might think is like, well, am I forgiven or not? You know, it's always good to to either hear from somebody else or to say to somebody else that you're sorry, right? To say it verbally so that you know that it's happened. And so that's really what this sacrament is all about. We get to hear it. Actually, we have to say it. We have to humble ourselves, and then we actually get to hear Jesus tell us that our sins are forgiven. So, and it's a very important. That's why in the church, that it, um, it's become one of the precepts of the church that we should confess our sins at least once a year. Of course, it's a great idea to do it more than that because, I mean, the more sins you get built up in your life, I mean, the harder it is to follow the Lord. Um, so, every time we go to confession, it kind of breaks that cycle. Of, of sin. So it's it's good to do it much more often than just once a year. But this is like the bare minimum. Like if we don't at least get rid of our sins once a year, then how we're going to have room in our, our lives and our hearts for the grace that God really wants to give us. So if we look a little bit, how do we go to confession? You guys have gone to confession, but we can briefly look at how we go and uh, just throw a Everybody loves waiting in line for confession, right? I don't like it either. <laughs> See, as a priest, as a priest going to confession, often we'll go when there's other priests that are available so that we don't, have, we don't actually go to another church and have to wait in line. Because <laughs> I don't like waiting in line either. But sometimes we wait in line. What do, you, what do we think about when we're in line for confession? So there we go. Now we're better. I wonder how many rosaries I'll have to pray this time. <sighs> the DMV is faster than this. If I die right now, will I go to hell? Does this sin make my soul look fat? There's something in here about the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Oh no, I can almost hear what that person is saying in their confession. Does this priest have a rating on Yelp? <sighs> Could you save the pencil after confession? Have you seen all those things? I gotta get some of these out of the way now! What is he doing here? He never does anything wrong. I wonder what he did. Oh, no, no, focus. Pray. Really? I wonder if he'll recognize my voice. Should I disguise it? Oh no, it's my turn. Forgive us, Father, for we have sinned, and it has been one, two, no, five, no, four months since our last confession, yes! So I don't know many of those thoughts ever go through your mind when you're waiting for confession. But <laughs> Before we go to confession, we should examine our conscience. This is really what we should be going through our mind. So the time that we wait... Um, can be used for that, thinking about what sins we should we should uh, confess. And I know that sometimes, like it'll happen to me um, too, is that you're thinking about your sins, and then you get in the confessional, and then you like forget everything you were thinking of. It's like I know I have some that I was thinking of, but now they're gone. Well, one of the things you can do is ask the Holy Spirit. Okay, Holy Spirit, help me to think of the sins that you want me to confess, so that when we go in the confessional, He's going to help you remember the ones that you need to say. And if you happen to forget them, well, you've asked for his help to remember the ones that, he, that God wants you to say. So if you happen to forget some, 
I mean, we can always end with, and for anything that I forgot, any sins I've forgotten, I'm truly sorry. So that can be a help so that we're confident that, okay, I've asked God for the help to remember what I need to remember to say. And so if I can't remember it, that must not be something that's essential to me saying right now because I've asked God to make to help me remember it. <laughs> so that can be a great way to, uh, to kind of go about if you have trouble remembering everything that you were thinking about prior to going into the confession. So uh, I actually put together a whole... Uh, When it is your turn. Turn that off. All right. I put together a whole a whole practical video at my last parish to teaching people how to go to confession uh, because uh, they they wanted for the kids it was grade school they wanted to help learn to go to confession. Kids thought it was a really awesome video because I play both parts in the video. So that's not actually possible to like hear your own confession. You have to go to a different priest. But so. Start with, bless me, Father, for I've sinned, and tell how long it's been since your last confession, because that's a part of helping the priest understand, you know, like, how how long it's been, like, how much stuff is kind of built up. Um, so it's good to say that. Then, you, then, we, then we will tell all of our sins. At the end, we can say something like, for these and all my sins, I'm very sorry, or for any sins I've forgotten, I'm very sorry. Then the priest is going to give you a penance. Uh, in, in response, he might give some advice. That's a possibility too. One thing, if, you, if you're if you looking for certain help with some kind of sin, you can ask the priest specifically for that. You may be like, well, I'd like, you know, what are some good things to help me deal with whatever's going on? Then he's going to ask you to say your act of contrition. Uh, of course, in the confessional, you can be either kneeling or, or seated behind a screen or face to face, whatever you guys are comfortable with. And so you'll say your act of contrition. We we have copies in the confessional, you know, in case you can't remember uh, how to say. Though there's like at least I don't know four or five different versions of it <laughs> that are out there. Uh, so then the priest is going to give the prayer of absolution. So he's going to pray over you. Sometimes when I do it, like the little kids do it for the first time, they think that I'm giving them a high five. So I've had that happen before. Where like they give me a high five in the confessional. So it's like. Yeah, sins are forgiven. <laughs> so he's forgiving. <laughs> Priest is forgiving your sins using the prayer. So I absolve you from your sins. Absolve means to be forgiven. So he make the sign of the cross, and then we make the sign of the cross, receiving that blessing of, of forgiveness. And uh, so then the priest will tell you to go in peace. And so then you will go and uh, you can go do your penance, whatever penance that... Uh, uh, the priest has given you during that time as well. All right. Okay, we don't have to watch me do my penance. <laughs> so, bless me, Father, I sinned. Even pandas go, no. All right. Pope Francis told us that, you know, the confession, sometimes, I mean, most normal people don't always, don't really enjoy going to confession. I mean, you have to go in front of somebody, admit you've done something wrong. It's really not the most fun thing to do. But Pope Francis says, Confessions is not about sitting in a torture chamber. It's not why we make you do it. <laughs> it's not to torture you. It's a celebration to keep clean the white garment of our Christian dignity. You know, this is the whole purpose of it, is to get rid of all that junk. And so as difficult and or as... As unpleasant as sometimes as it is going to confession, hopefully many of you have experienced coming out of confession where it just feels like you're a new person again after you've gotten rid of all that stuff. Because that's often the way people will experience confession. We truly come in and we truly give all those things over to God. We come out feeling like, wow, like a weight has been taken off of me. I'm a new, I'm a completely new person. So St. John Chrysostom says we should be ashamed of when we sin, but not when we go to confession. Because now we're actually at our best. We're at our worst when we sin. We're at our best when we're there confessing. Um, don't have to worry about the priest ever saying anything. I cannot ever say anything at all. Um, it's completely confidential. In fact, I can be excommunicated from the church for breaking the seal of confession. So no priest is ever going to do that. So you can tell us anything at all. In fact, there's a this is a, a movie that was... Uh, um, produced called I Confess, and it was it set up the situation in which the priest like 
a murderer comes to the priest and tells him he's committed the crime. And uh, so the priest knows about it, but the guy doesn't actually confess it out loud. And, and so then the priest is actually arrested mistakenly for having done the crime. And so he's put on trial, and he, he, he knows obviously who it is who did it, but he heard it in confession. So he can't defend himself. And uh, so um, it just sets up this situation in which, you know, how serious the sacrament of the, 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 uh, the seal of the confessional is, that the priest can't say anything about what happens, even in the case like that. Even in the case of like, if you were to come into the confessional, and then after you're done with confession, you were t I couldn't tell you what you just told me in the confessional. I couldn't even tell you what you just said. Once, we're, once, once confession is done, unless, if you want to talk about what you told me in the confessional, you have to tell me about it outside the confessional. That's how strict the seal of confession is for me. Like, if you go into confession and you want to tell people about what you said in confession, <laughs> you can if you want. I mean, if you really want to tell people your sins, that's okay, I guess. But we can't say anything. So it's, it's on the priest, not on the person who goes into the, in, into the confessional. So. All right. Um, I think we'll skip over this this video. Uh, it it makes the I don't know why it's <laughs> muting all of my things, but um, it's muting the ones I want muted, and it's not muting the ones I want muted. <laughs> um, so in this video, they basically use the analogy. You know, as priests, we're like God's garbage men. When you come and get rid of your trash with us, you know, and just as you shouldn't be feel ashamed to like take your trash out, like I mean. What's the garbage man gonna say? You know, he's gonna look through. I mean, he doesn't look through your garbage and be like, "Oh my, look at what they're throwing away now." They just throw it away, right? Same way with the priest. He's not gonna judge you for the things that you say. Just get rid of it. Just get rid of it. It's that's what we're here for. We're like God's garbage men. All right. So let's skip over that. Yeah. Before confession, after confession. All right, so we got to continue on to the next sacrament, anointing of the sick. All right, so anointing of the sick is related to the fact that there is sin, and the consequence of sin is death. So our bodies were never meant to fall apart the way that they do now, but it's all a result of, of sin. And so the first death came very soon after Adam and Eve sinned. This, is meant, uh, this represents the death of, of Abel after he's murdered by his brother. Um, of course, Jesus comes to transform the meaning of death, that he brings his power to overcome death in, in our lives. So uh, we see Jesus as part of his ministry, healing, physically healing people. We kind of mentioned that already. So um, some of the people at, they, at Jesus' time, they thought that you know when somebody is suffering from an illness, that it was due to the fact that they must have sinned and God was punishing them with an illness. Well, Jesus affirms that this isn't the case. You know, they ask, you know, this blind man, did he sin or his parents sin, making him blind? Well, Jesus says, well, no, it has nothing to do with that. Neither he nor his parents sinned, it, so the works of God might be made visible through him. It has nothing to do with personal sin, our illnesses. So um, when we experience illnesses or in and of ourself or our loved one, God's not punishing us for something. They're not necessary. They're not related in that way. They're related in a general way in which sin came into our world and causes suffering and death, but they're not specifically related that I must have sinned. That's why I'm suffering through this kind of illness. Um, and so Jesus, not only he wants to overcome sin, but he also wants to overcome the the results of sin, the kind of falling apart. So we see him even healing and raising people from the dead as part of his ministry. So the church itself has been given a part in this healing ministry as well. So priests have this sacrament that they do, the anointing of the sick, where they go and they can heal people. But even you can participate in some way in this role. All of us have a role to go and visit those that are sick. So visiting somebody in a nursing home or hospital to pray with them, encourage them to kind of unite their sufferings with Jesus. That's really what we can do is... is uh, um, is Offer the things that we go through, uniting them to Jesus, just like I kind of talked about when we were at Mass. You know, we offer ourselves to him. Well, each day we can offer the stuff that goes on, and, and especially those that are going through sickness or suffering can unite themselves to Jesus. Uh, we also bring communion to those that are sick. Uh, 
here in our parish, I'll I'll go on first Fridays and and visit people that are homebound in our town here and uh, bring them communion. Um, so, but that's something that like if you become an extraordinary minister, Holy Communion, you know, at the end of Mass uh, today, when we have the small group of people that line up after communion, they take the pixes with the Eucharist to some of our parish members that are uh, in their homes. Um, so we bring that, and we have a special name for the. For Eucharist, when you receive it before somebody dies, it's called viaticum, which means food for the journey. So the Eucharist is to help us to journey our way to heaven. And so we should receive it our whole life, even up to um, those the time before before he calls us home. Um, so if we look at what, the, what happens at the anointing, it really comes from the book of James in the Bible, the, the, the kind of the rite itself. We actually read this as part of the rite. So it says, are the people sick among you? Let them send for the priests of the church. So the first thing we do is we call for the priests and let the priests pray over them. So there's a prayer that's part of it. And then and it says, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. So there is an oil of the, of the sick that we use to anoint them uh, with oil. And then we also, so those are the three actions. So, so those are like the visible signs as part of the sacrament. Then we also have the effects that it does listed in this passage. It says the prayer of faith will save the sick persons and raise them up. And if they've committed any sins, their sins will be forgiven. So the first thing that this sacrament does is it saves the sick and raises them up. So it can lift them up both from their sickness. So through this sacrament, it can, it can help to heal their physical illness, as well as ultimately the resurrection of the body or save us from sin. And then it gives us, it can forgive sins as part of the sacrament too. Like let's say somebody is elderly and they can no longer confess their sins. Well, the sacrament of the anointing, um, if they are unable to express their sins at that point, can also ensure that their sins are forgiven um, for them. Who can receive the sacrament of reconciliation? Well, somebody whose health is seriously impaired by sickness or old age. So we wouldn't anoint you like if you have a cold. <laughs> that's not quite the time for anointing but if you have if you're in danger because of age or sickness kind of in danger of death even from this um, another place might be a serious injury or if you have a surgery if you're going to go into surgery you can receive the anointing of the sick to help um, sustain you while, you're, while you, when you go through that because any kind of major surgery can have I mean medicines obviously a lot safer than in the past but it can have I mean there could be po the possibility of complications and so whenever, you know, somebody's put under and things like that, I mean, I mean, it could be an occasion of receiving uh, this sacrament. So not just anybody receives it, but you do have to be, um, it has to be serious as part of it. So it's not just for the moment of death. So obviously, like if somebody's dying and I come to their home, I will do the anointing at that point too. But one doesn't have to wait <laughs> until the moment when someone is dying. It's for, it's for the sick as they go through sickness. And you can receive anointing more than once. So if somebody is, is sick, you can receive it more uh, more than one time. Um, to go to somebody's house, there isn't any preparation that somebody needs to do. Just call the priest anytime. We'll come. Um, that's why the, as, as priests, we have an emergency line at the parish so that if you ever need the priest for anything, for an emergency, you can call the parish and you can hit the right button. It, it'll tell you on there and it'll send you to my cell phone and you should be able to get to get a hold of me fairly quickly. Um, assuming I'm not at mass or something, <laughs> um, but anytime, like that's one of the reasons for like the middle of the night, somebody can bother me in the middle of the night and I'll go and I mean, this is, that's the kind of emergency that, you know, can wake up a priest for at any, any point for, uh, um, so actually go, they used to have, uh, like sick call sets that families could set up. I mean, they still exist. Um, so, um. That they can set up a cross and candles when the priest comes, but it's not necessary, but it's a nice thing that could be set up. Um, so there's a prayer of faith as part of that. So we pray together as a family when I come there. There's also other prayers that we can pray as part of like if they're in the process of dying or if they're the, – the, there's a whole bunch of different kind of prayers in our ritual book that we use to, petty, that, to help us fit the specific situation of illness that the individual might be going on. So – as I mentioned already, there's a laying on of hands, so the hand gets placed on their forehead, and there is also an anointing with oil. So after placing the hand on the forehead, then I make the sign of the cross. 
with oil on their forehead as well as on the palms of their hands. Those are the two places. And the oil symbolizes the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's a symbol of healing as well as strengthening, but of course it actually brings about God's grace. So those are the prayers that we pray. And it's amazing because there's, there are, there, you know, first it heals the, the soul. It helps to unite us to, to God through the difficult time of illness. But it also can heal them physically. And I actually, the very first anointing that I ever did, um, I went, I was in Papillion and I went to the hospital, had an emergency call, went to the hospital, I anointed this, this woman who had cancer. And, uh, um, I, and I told I must have told her that I, this was my first time that I, this is my very first anointing as a new priest and uh, never never talked to her like I didn't even know who she really was you know um, I don't think she was a Christian or anything um, but three years later I get this phone call out of the blue from this woman I didn't know who it was when she called me and she's like she's like can I come in and and meet with you sure of course but she comes in and she's like. So three years ago, you came to the hospital, you anointed me when I had cancer. And I just wanted to tell you that it's been three years now and I'm cancer free. And it's just kind of pretty neat kind of thing to see that. Obviously, I'm sure the medical stuff helped her as well. But to see how the sacrament helped her during that time uh, when she was going through that illness. It's a pretty neat thing to see. Not every time... Not every time I anoint somebody are they going to get better. Sometimes it helps them through the dying process to meet the Lord. Um, but it's primarily for the good of their soul. So uh, I kind of talked about some of the effects already. Um, so it's a good thing if any, if any kind of thing happens to call a priest. You know, if somebody is dying or if somebody's in an accident or something, to let the priest know. You can even carry with you, um, you know, to let somebody know you're a Catholic. You know, carry a little. We actually have I, cards up on the, in the display in the back. They have some cards back there. If you want a card to take with you to, like, in case of emergency, call the priest. I'm a Catholic. All right. So those are the ones of healing. Oh man, we're almost out of time. We don't have much time for matrimony and holy orders. Well, it's a good thing we're going to talk a little. We'll talk a little bit more about them as well when we kind of talk about you know, when God sends us on mission, because these last two are about being on mission or service of others. Um, they're, a rep, they're a call that God will give to all of us. All of us have a call where God asks us to do a certain thing. Um, obviously, we're all called to be his disciples, but within being his disciples, he has a specific plan for each one of us. And that's part of our, you know, part of where you're at now is you're going to be discerning what is the call greater for me in the future? Because it might be to the, one of these two sacraments, or it could be something else. Um, but ultimately, the... Four words for you. Ready? God's will equals happiness. So, uh, whenever we find God's call for us, it's going, to, it's going to be what makes us the most... It's going to make us happy. Because that's God's will will lead us to happiness. So, Let's see here. Yeah. God's will equals happiness. All right. So, all sorts of different kinds of vocations, depending upon who the individual is, to be married or um, even while one is single, permanent deacons, consecrated life, religious life, priesthood. Um, sometimes we just use the word vocation to talk about priests and religious, but it actually refers to any kind of call that God could call us to. Because there's so many. St. Augustine used an example of like a flower garden um, as to the different examples of vocations. That there's, there's so many different flowers in the garden that each of us can be very different from one another. So, you know, God's garden, there's not only the roses of the martyrs who die for his sake, there's also lilies of virgins and ivy of wedded couples and violets of widows. So whatever stage or place that we're at in our life, we have a call. God specifically calls us to a certain place. Um, even when we're, you know, maybe single, maybe in the future, God might call, you know, a number of you to married life, or he could call you to holy orders or, or consecrated life. Um, the vocation as a single is, is that just because you are single doesn't necessarily mean you're following a specific vocation. But when somebody is single, you can purposely 
be striving to follow what God's call is. You know, so somebody could be single and not paying attention to God's call. So that means you're not really living out of vocation as a single person. But if you are a single person, you're specifically discerned that this is the direction God wants me to do right now, then you are following a vocational call um, during that point. So those are some uh, uh, focused missionaries um, that are single men and women that serve on college campuses to um, uh, help lead college students to, uh, to Christ. Um, marriage. It's one of these two, so marriage and holy orders. So the sacrament of marriage is all about a husband and wife, a man and a woman, coming together so that their love is modeled after the love between Jesus and the church. And from within that vocation, then they also participate in God's creative abilities to bring a new life into the world. So this is my, uh, my sister and her husband, and that's my uh, niece and nephew, Sophia and Luke. So... They have received the vocation of marriage. So uh, we see that vocation of, of marriage. Jesus gives it to us at the wedding feast at Cana. Um, is was when he makes marriage a sacrament. Uh, we could go more into that, but we don't have any time to do that. So we'll skip some of that. Um, one, of the, one of the things I want to point out when it comes to marriage is one of the most profound places in the Bible that talks about marriage. Though some people... Don't always think it is, because like it from the part in the Bible from in Ephesians, the letter to Ephesians that Saint Paul says it starts with that wives should be subordinate to their husbands, and some people are like, well, does that mean that you know women just have to be dominated by men and do whatever they say? Like, honey, go make me a sandwich. And, okay, I better be subordinate to my husband. Well, that's really not what Saint Paul is talking about. Subordinate really means. The same thing as so, – so to be subordinate means the same thing to be submissive, which sounds worse in our language than subordinate. Uh, but actually, s submission means submission, under a mission. So it means that the wife is under the mission of the husband. And then you have to ask, well, what's the husband's mission? Because as men, we don't get to make it up. Jesus gives us our mission. So wives be under the mission of your husband. Husband, here's the mission of the husband. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. So how did Jesus love the church? He died for the church, right? So this is the mission of husbands and all men, really. Your mission is to love as Christ loves to death. So when it says, ladies, that wives should be subordinate to their husbands, it means be under, allow your husbands to love you to the point of death. How does that sound? Isn't that the kind of love you want, right? Isn't that the kind of love you, you deserve? Is somebody who would love you so much that they would even die for you? Well, that's precisely Jesus' love for all of us. So, uh oh, suddenly that's a little bit tougher for us guys, right? We got we have to be Jesus for them. And so, ladies, I mean, if you're entering into relationship, this is something to remember. Is like, I mean. That's what you've been made for. You've been made for the kind of love where he needs to be willing to give up of, of himself. Maybe not, I mean, if, you're, if you want to marry somebody, you probably don't actually want them to physically die. You know, <laughs> but, but like die to ourself, die to selfishness. Put you first before them. Of course, it also says in that passage here, it says, uh, be subordinate to one another. Out of reverence for Christ. So we're actually supposed to love each other in that way, both, both ways. So it's a two way thing, not just the guy's always making sacrifices for you, but the lady's making sacrifice back and forth. Um, so, but the men have to lead in that because our, we're supposed to be modeled after Jesus, and you guys and the ladies represent the church in that relationship. So this is this beautiful, beautiful passage. Uh, from the scriptures and like for, for me as a priest it has meaning too because I'm in Jesus's person and my spouse is the church and so I need to too also offer of myself in that same kind of way so um, even in the the promises and the vows at the wedding this is what the couple promises um, to love the way that God loves so in each of the promises that you say when you're getting married 
Um, you promise a love that's free, total, faithful, and fruitful. These are characteristics of God's love. So you say in the first line, you said you're, you've, you've come here without coercion, freely. You're freely going to love this person. No one's forcing you guys to get married. You know, he hasn't like, you know, pull a gun out and be like, you have to marry me. He, obviously, that's not love, right? <laughs> it has to be free. It has to be uh, total, wholeheartedly. I give my whole self to you. I can't, you don't hold anything back. You want to give your whole self. So it's free. It's total. Um, there's a fidelity that you'll be with each other for as long as you live. Marriage is until death. There's nothing that can break the, break the vow once you make it. I mean, it's permanent. Only, the only thing that can break it is death. So it's a faithfulness because that's how God's love is faithful. And it's also a love that's fruitful. There's an openness to the new life of children. God's love is very fruitful in our lives. Um, that's what we've been talking about, his, his grace through the sacraments. Um, and so um, this is also expressed, this giving of your whole self in your wedding vows um, as well. So many of the things, we'll, we'll talk another t time when we look at morality. The things that the church teaches when it comes to areas of sexuality that has to do with us being men and women um, is really dependent upon that the way that he created marriage to be is meant to be modeled after his love between Jesus and the church. And if we make marriage or sexuality to be something different than what he made it, we're either saying that we're not made the way that he said we are, or that we're, we, marriage doesn't actually image God, um, we're making it into something completely different. So we'll look at that a little bit when we talk about uh, um, uh, morality. So let's we'll, we'll skip over that. Okay. Anyway, yes. Married vocation. And finally, very briefly, I've kept you long, but holy orders. <laughs> um, priests, deacons, bishops. Um, some deacons can be permanent deacons, like we have, our, we have one in our parish. Um, um, the same time that he gave us the Eucharist, he gave us priests. Um, so that's when Jesus gave us uh, priests, because you can't have the Eucharist without priests to be able to do the Eucharist. To, uh, then that's one of the things that priests do. We offer sacrifice. So we offer Jesus' sacrifice at the Mass. We're also spiritual fathers, so that's why we call priests fathers. So we do, we're at these most important parts of somebody's spiritual life, just as you know, our parents should are there for the things that are important to us, taking care of us. So we're very the priests are fatherly figures in the area of, of all of these different kind of moments in our life. Uh, priests remain celibate because in a sense we're married. We're married to the church, as I kind of already said. Uh, the church is my spouse, but we're also witnesses of heaven that, you know, no human being can fully satisfy us. We're made for God in heaven, and so some choose to renounce marriage for the sake of being a symbol to point to heaven. So that's kind of, that's why the priest's choice is. We also follow the example of Jesus. Jesus himself never was married because we are the church. We're his spouse. So that's why he never married, and so as priests, we imitate him. Um, and so it also makes us available for service. You know, sometimes people will put ideas out there like, well, you know, we'd have more priests if priests could get married. Well, actually, probably the reality would be we have less priests and they would be less available to us as well. If you think about it, I mean, if a priest were married, he'd need to spend some time with his family, right? <laughs> you know, he should spend, at least, I mean, if you're thinking like, well, half time with his family, half the time with the parish. Well, what happens if like, you know, you know, the priest and his his wife and maybe their child is sick and they need to take him to the doctor and at the same time he gets an emergency call where he has to go visit this other person. As the priest's wife, would you want your husband running off at this point to go take care of somebody else or be with you during this other during to take care of your own family? You know, that's a pretty big conflict there. And so it's a great gift of celibacy that the priest has so that I can be very available to the needs of my spouse, which is is the church. Um, so, um, we also like to have fun too. So, it's not all work and prayer. So, this was the uh, we had the softball game between the the uh, priests in the Omaha and Lincoln diocese. We actually won this past year. Yes, but here's a cl here's a clip from the first one that we did. It's kind of a, a fun little sacred. Oh 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 yeah. oh 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 oh
house. Oh my gosh. He, he, he put dirt on the plate. Father, oh God. Father, oh God. He's ejected from the game. Father, is gone. Father, is gone. Yeah. He's yeah. 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 bringing his oh, bag. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. 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 Father Branson's father is taking away his soul, and he's offering confession to Father Cook. This is brilliant. This is classic. Oh. He gets another chance. Oh, boy. All right, home umpire Scott Nance played that beautifully, guys. Yeah, nice. And they're hugging, and everybody's fine. Oh, that. All right. So, sorry I kept it a little bit longer. Next time, we're going to look at confirmation.